Well, here we are. It is Friday, uh, February 23rd, 2024, and this is the weekly video. Uh, some of you noticed that we put up an earlier video today, and it was one just to get caught up on some uh, price results that we hadn't uh, included in last week's video uh, that I thought were important. I thought you'd be interested to know about because we had talked about them prior, and it's always good to try to follow up. So that's what that was the point of that. And this is the regular video, and we're going to get into a whole bunch of things uh, uh, that have, have turned up on the uh, on the auction platforms around the world. Uh, there's not a lot going on as we head into Asia week, but that'll be starting in March, and there's some pretty good sales coming up, I suspect, um, and uh, we're going to be uh, uh, talking a bit about the sale coming up at uh, 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 Bonhams, who landed some interest, sounds like very interesting lots from the Metropolitan, and uh, we'll be learning a good deal more about that probably next week. So stay tuned. Um, any rate, uh, here we are. And uh, I want to start first with over here with some of the lots that closed. Um, uh, let's see here. We already talked about that the other day. Uh, bang. There we go. Uh, you may remember we talked about this uh, 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 painting um, a, a few months ago, uh, a few weeks ago, rather, when it was first posted, because it was uh, very much in the manner of George Shinnery. And I think it's a pretty good painting, and I think possibly somebody got a very good buy. I heard from a couple of people that know a good bit about this artist, and um, they said, boy, there's an 80 90% chance this was a George Chinnery painting. If it was, and it went for $600, it was, it was the bargain of the week. So uh, you may see it turning up a, a, again somewhere or being donated possibly to an institution. But regardless, it was done in the period and the style of at least, and it was awfully nice uh, uh, Chinese provincial scene uh, painting um, uh, with some iron workers. I thought it was very, very interesting. And uh, just for $600 plus premium, that was an absolute bargain for good on whoever bought it. I hope one of you got it. Um, and then uh, over to this. This was something that was sold uh, at Lucati. Lucati out in uh, Pineville, Pennsylvania. They had a sale. And there was this, this Gossu Blue Decorated uh, Dragon Spout Teapot. I think this was a very, very reasonable price for this. Um, Gossu Blue uh, Satsuma here is uh, one of the most desirable color palettes, one of the most desirable enamels you can find on Satsuma. Uh, people, There are people out there who collect only uh, works with Gasu on it, and this had a ton of it, and it looked like it was in pretty good shape. I don't see any damage to it at all. Signed on the bottom with a Shimazu clan mark. Uh, you'd have to go look it up, and it went for just $900 plus premium. Um, I thought the estimate was low on this um, because it's a rare form. Love the, love the serpent uh, body uh, handle on it, and uh, wonderfully decorated, finely decorated, and in good condition. So somebody got a very nice buy on that. And then over to this. Now, this was the um, Neil auction. And uh, in the video I did earlier, we, I talked a bit about the Korean uh, screen that sold uh, that they had estimated at $600 to $900 and ended up selling um, with the buyer's premium for about $116,000. They also had this cabinet, this shrine cabinet. And I'm afraid a lot of people didn't look at this very carefully, this listing. Always read the listings uh, because they tell you how big things are. And this was listed as one of these uh, uh, Buddhist shrines. And we've all seen them. If you collect Japanese stuff, you've seen lots of these Buddhist shrines around. And they tend to be anywhere from uh, 5 to 8 inches tall, 10 inches tall, maybe 15 inches tall if it's really big. Uh, but apparently, someone, um, a, a lot of people didn't bother to look at the size of this one. It was 5 feet tall, um, over 5 feet tall, actually, and, and 30 inches wide and 25 inches deep. This was a big shrine, and I think this was an absolute bargain. Uh, made during the late Edo to probably Meiji period. Uh, here's the interior of it. It looks like it's an elegant, perfect condition. Um, uh, the, the, during the Meiji period, the late Edo period, nobody did portable, nobody did home shrines the way the Japanese did them. Um, they were outstanding. Uh, this is such an elegant, elegant looking thing. Now, it didn't have the figures in it. You'd have to put your own figures in. But this was a home shrine, home altar for a very wealthy person. This was not the, for the average person, the average Joe, so to speak. And somebody bought this for $850 plus premium. Um, this was a big piece of furniture. It would make any room. Um, I was flabbergasted. I was stunned by the low estimate. I thought the estimate was ridiculous. And uh, I think the estimate killed the lot. This was a case where the estimate was too low uh, because it's a type of object that when you look at it, visually reads as, oh, it's a little home shrine. Yeah, seven, eight hundred bucks. 
Um, not, but and they may have looked up. I'm thinking. I'm just occurred to me that they may have looked up some of these shrines online and seen that they bring six or eight or nine hundred dollars, and not bothered to check the sizes. Uh, because the, the, this was obviously, you know, ten times larger than the average shrine, and the uh, metalwork on it looked absolutely stupendous. When you look at the hinges and the fittings, which they didn't really, I don't think they bothered really to photograph them up close. They didn't. Yeah, that was a mistake. They should have photographed this work because I'm going to bet it was stupendous, stupendously high quality. Uh, so if one of you got it, good, good on you. And then this was, of course, the $90,000 Korean scroll, a screen rather that was estimated at six to nine hundred dollars. Um, uh, I don't think I don't think they they checked too much on this probably before they sold it and uh, didn't realize that this was was not a late 19th to 20th century screen but it was mounted in the late 19th to 20th century it was an earlier one probably done during the late 18th early 19th century um, heck of a thing if any of you know anything about this or went to see it I'd love to send me an email about it I'd love to hear more about it. Uh, but that's the Korean screens have, have been known to spike like that for years. They bring more money than Chinese screens at, most of the time. It's, it's sort of interesting dynamic. And uh, this was this was also was this also this was at the Neil sale. I was stunned by this. This was estimated at just a hundred to hundred and fifty dollars, and that's what it brought. And uh, these uh, these uh, 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 grisaille sort of decorated dragon things that are done and known in the Sixi pattern um, typically bring a lot more than that. I'm not sure why. Um, it, it brought so little. Uh, in the past, we've seen these bring six or eight hundred dollars, and I just included this because it's sort of an odd price. It's an uh, it's a peculiar price for one of these, so I don't know what's going on with that. Um, and then over to this, the Shunga prints. So now these are Japanese prints, and 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 they turn up periodically. This was a set of five of them, and uh, Shunga are erotic art prints that were done um, uh, during the uh, during the Edo period and, and actually into the Meiji period. And they were extremely popular. I had read somewhere once they said that over 50% of all the Japanese woodblock prints that were produced um, in China, in Japan rather, were um, erotic prints. They were shunga. And, uh, uh, and uh, this was a great set. And I, maybe, maybe people don't realize um, how rare these are. They do not turn up often. Um, they rarely turn up. Uh, these look like nice old ones. They were very nicely and interestingly framed. Um, and uh, they went for nothing. They went for forty bucks a piece plus premium, basically. Um, this was this was a great buy, and this was also at Neil's. Uh, I don't know where the Japanese uh, print buyers were, but uh, these were in, uh, hugely collected in Japan um, uh, during the, during the nineteenth century. And then they fell out of favor, and a lot of them were destroyed um, during the Meiji Restoration. Uh, they were they they were they were begin to be looked upon as being vulgar, sort of, and they got rid of a lot of them. But they made a lot of them and uh, every once in a while they, they turn up and this was an opportunity for anybody who's a shunga buyer to get an absolute steal uh, in the past i've seen these uh, these types of prints sell for five to nine hundred dollars a piece um and, and in this case they went for nothing so they went way under the radar um again japanese art can, you can still find some fantastic buys and speaking of which there was this this pair of um uh, abalone shell oops abalone type uh, uh, uh porcelain dishes um, done and they did these often in Satsuma and occasionally they did them in Arita wares and that's what these are in Amari and uh, these these are very very nice uh, quite elegant beautifully done and they reverse uh, you'll notice that the you look at it this way it doesn't matter which way you turn them they whether, whether it's uh, the, the, the shell facing this way they look the same as when they reverse it and the shell is going the other way it's a sort of an interesting optical thing that they did with them uh, very, very nice. And they went for peanuts. They went for $225 plus premium. Um, I've said it so many times that J Japanese art is such a great buy in the market because these were beautifully done and made during the Edo. During, during, well, these were probably done during the Meiji period. And they were sold by St. Charles Antiques, which I believe is a, that shop in um, um, uh, New Orleans, right? St. Charles, aren't they in New Orleans? Um, and this was, uh, no, this was Neil Auctions in New Orleans, so 
there you are. It's no surprise. Um, and then this, coming back to this, the Japanese wood carving um, on the on the on the uh, on the you know on this uh, plastic uh, lucite stand. Uh, we talked about this a few weeks ago because visually, this this reads visually. Again, you get back to how things read visually. This is why I always say, put a, if you have something you're selling and it's uh, it's of an unusual size or you want to show how big it is, put something in the picture that's familiar visually to everybody so they can get a rough idea on how big it is because. This looks in the photograph like it was maybe seven or eight inches tall. It wasn't. It was over 50 inches tall. This was a big object, and it had this nice lucite stand, beautifully carved. Now, they dated it as being very, very early. I don't think it was. I think it was Edo to Meiji period, but it was wonderfully carved. And you may remember that there was a uh, there's a contemporary Japanese carver who had a number of his carvings very similar in style to this, but he, he uses ironwork. Um, to cleat the pieces together that's been selling. I think he went through Christie's on two occasions and his carvings done like this. And he's a contemporary artist. He's wonderful. I love his work. Um, sold for several hundred thousand dollars. And this is that style. This is w what he's borrowing from when he does those contemporary works. They come from work like this. And this was either done during the Edo or the early Meiji period, I guess. And it was a big, big carving, wonderfully done. And it went for just 2200 plus premium. Uh, rather an exceptional buy, I think, $2,500 for a big decoration for your living room. To be honest, I'd get rid of the Lucite stand. I don't like it. Um, I'd, I'd, get, I'd have a, a nice wooden stand, maybe a lacquer stand, black lacquer stand made for it. I think it would be much more appropriate than putting them on plastic. Um, I, enough with the Lucite. I, I don't, I'm not a fan of Lucite. I think it's, it's, it's kind of gross. Um, and, and shouldn't it's not an organic material. I like organic materials when, when things are on display. Um, and then this, we talked about this because we commented that this was, I didn't feel that this was a, uh, it was in the sale that was at Leonard's um, uh, up in Addison, Illinois. And they had cataloged this as being an, um, sort of a, a later, I think maybe they stripped the date off at one point. But, it, but initially, I believe they had listed it as a 19th century or late Ming, late Qing um, a bodhisattva. And we commented on it. And I think they ed edited the uh, listing. They just called it a Chinese partial built ground bodhisattva. Um, I feel, because it looks, I see traces of um, a lacquer on this still and so forth. And to me, and as I said a few weeks ago, it looks like a late Ming to early Qing example. And these are often mistaken for some reason as being late 19th century. I bought one at an auction outside of Boston a few years ago that was listed as um, late Qing or something like that. And it was it was Ming and it had the, the, the whole lotus plinth and everything. And I, I picked it up for about the same price as this, seven or $8,000. And uh, ended up selling it, I think, for uh, on eBay, actually, for about 30 31,000 or something. Anyway, this is a very similar situation. Uh, very nicely done. Doesn't have a base to it, but we had com I had commented, I thought that this was most likely a late Ming to early, very early Qing thing. The only thing I might be early Qing is because of the way the eyes are done. But at any rate, it was very nice. Sold for 8,500 plus premium. So around $11,000 by the time it's all, or 10,000 by the time it's all said and done, 10 and a half thousand. But I think it was worth it. This was a nice, nice um, uh, bit of lacquer work. Nice bit of bronze work, rather, with, with, with gold lacquer traces over it. All right. And then over here to this, this was up on eBay. We're going to just a few eBay uh, results because there wasn't that much on there. Mostly right now on eBay, what I'm seeing is it, and it seems to be getting thinner and thinner. Um, I'm seeing more and more uh, plates common plates uh, and that sort of thing, which is great if you collect plates because I, I think you're going to see the prices get very favorable on those. Um, but uh, 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 vases and jars and bowls that are really interesting seem to be much more common over on um, uh, uh, live auctioneers and invaluable and turning up at, at, at mid mid-size auction houses like Leland Ox Leland's and uh, uh, Brunks and uh, that sort of thing and then the bigger houses Freeman's and Doyle's Christie's Bonham's and, and so forth um, seem to be getting the lion's share of them but we are seeing a huge amount of fakes turning up um, uh, and very good ones and the fakes are getting better and better I'm just going to warn you about it. I've seen some amazing fakes of Chinese export pieces, especially armorial wares lately. Um, it's really disturbing. So just just a heads up on that. But this was that that um, enamel bowl, and as I recall, it had a bit of damage to it on one side. Um, maybe it didn't. Maybe this was the one that was okay. 
Maybe this one was okay. Um, we had, there was one that was damaged. You may recall we talked about it, but this one looks like it was might have been okay. Uh, nice looking bowl with um, uh, pomegranates on it and, and, and uh, citra, uh, uh, fruit rather, and grapes and whatnot. Late 18th, early 19th century piece. And I, I brought $602, but it was a nice object. Who was the seller of this? Um, oh, Stubsy Wubsy. Yeah, no, not a surprise. Yeah, nice blue interior. I love that color blue on the inside. Very nice. And uh, brought $602, which is fine. It looks like it's about four inches in diameter. Um, and then over to this, the teapot. This was sold by the, the Shangri-La guys. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, antiques and uh, ceramics and collectibles over in the Netherlands. Uh, they sell a lot of stuff. They have a huge amount of stuff. They have a huge amount of stuff also on their own website if you want to go see it. Um, um, and they're, 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 they've been in business now quite a while. And they do a very good job. And they have nice things. And I think they, they started out as government employees. I think they worked for the Dutch government or, the, or somewhat, something like that. I heard a story. And then they they, they met each other. And they were both dealers. And uh, they decided to quit and start a business. And I think they've been very successful. So good on that. Um, this teapot. The nice teapot. They dated to the Kang Shi period. Um, it's simple and elegantly decorated, I think is the way to describe this. And I think the price was a bargain, $190 US. It had just a couple of minor uh, chips. It had a tiny, tiny nick on the spout that I noticed. And it looks like somebody may have dropped the lid at one point. And you'll see so, there's some uh, chipping off of here. And it may be that the finial was fritted to begin with and then it bumped something and knocked more of it off. But that's a real easy fix. You take to go to any ceramic repair person and they can fix that like nothing. You'll never see it again. Uh, very easy to do. $190 for a nice Kang Shi teapot. I think that was a very, very, very good buy uh, for whoever got it. And then over to this. This was a little stand. And I talk about stands once in a while because stands have become very valuable. If, 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 if you come across well carved, not the basic, you know, the standard ones that are sort of boring, but if you come across a really nice stand, um, uh, and it's inexpensive and, and you, cause sometimes you find them in antique shops and especially at, 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 at uh, like antique malls or, um, uh, boot sales as they call them overseas or, or flea market sales as they call them here. Um, uh, look, always be on the lookout for little Chinese wooden stands because 90% of the time they're grossly undervalued by the seller. Um, and I've seen some awfully good ones. I've seen stands just like this put up for sale and you'll see them in a, in a booth at an antique, antique mall or, um, you know, at, a, at an open air flea market sale or something. And the, a, stands like this will be priced for 20 or 30 or $40 sometimes, very often. And uh, as you can see here, this one brought $407. You can make, you can make, if you're a dealer, you can make a lot of good money on the side just by selling old stands because there is a, a desperate market for them in China. Um, not the standard boring ones, but ones that are carved like this have a little patina to them. Most of them were made during the late 19th and early 20th century, but they were meticulously made and uh, uh, beautifully, beautifully carved. So just, just a, a quick heads up for that. All right, now um, over here, uh, what's coming up? on eBay. There's, there's a number of things coming up this week on eBay. One of them is this. This is a good size silk and it's a little bit confusing how they did the pictures because this is the entire silk on the left and the detail shot is on the right. And um, when I first saw it, I couldn't figure out quite, a, quite what it was they were trying to do. Uh, but this is a nice piece of silk. It's up to $1,600. And I'm not surprised. If you look at the, the quality of the work, it's uh, made probably during the uh, 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 Dalguan, the Tung Chi period, from what I'm seeing. It's very nicely done. They're calling it a wall hanging. Um, it's got some poles and whatnot in it, but it's big. It's, the dimensions they've got hidden in here. Um, 64 by 38 inches. So it's roughly uh, five by uh, three feet. It's a pretty good size silk. And uh, the seller of this is uh, it often comes up with nice things. It's co they're called 1860 to 1960. And if you buy Chinese silks and you like rank badges and things like this, you might want to follow these guys. They don't have them all the time, but when they see them, they get them. And they sell textiles. They're mostly textile dealers, but they get very, very good things. They're out in Southern Cal San Mateo, California is where they work. Um, and every once in a while, boy, they come up with some nice silks. This is one of them. It closes um, in four days. It's like I said, it's already up to $1,600. I bet it's going to do pretty well because silks uh, have been remarkably resilient in the market. Robes, rank badges, all that. And we're going to get to some of those rank badges when we, we cover the Leland Little Sale because their rank badges did great. 
um, uh, and the rondelles, they took off. Um, and then over to uh, this, the vase. This is a nice vase. It's a, it's a second half of the 19th century um, blue and white vase, faceted, but it's big. It's 23, 23 inches, is it? As I recall, something like that. Um, oh, it's 18 inches tall. It's still a big vase, uh, but it's got a great look to it. I love, I love the mountains coming down. And you probably have seen these before. They have, it has the Buddhist beads at the top here, and then you have a landscape scene, and then a, a, a border, and then a large landscape scene wrapping around the whole thing with uh, uh, people traveling. You have a, a, a person here riding a horse, and uh, uh, another person with a child, a seat, you know, like an elder. Uh, with a child crossing the bridge and so forth, and then done, and then floral uh, work at the bottom. It's got there. There's a, give a sense of the size. It's a big piece of porcelain. It's got uh, three days to go. It closes on Monday. It should bring uh, nine to fifteen hundred dollars pretty easily. Um, I don't know how many people are watching it. Of course, it has a. Uh, is it of a chip out of it? it? Looks like it has a couple of a couple of chips out of the top of it. Still, it should do very well. Wonderfully painted. A lot of lot of blue in this. Um, and the uh, bottom of it um, looks like that, which is often how they look. These uh, these big vases often have these sort of deep platform recessed vases uh, like that. That's that's exactly what you expect to see under here. And uh, right now it's up to just $129. So you might want to, that'll be on the new. These will all be on the newsletter page this week over on Bitamount. Um, um, so just go over there and check it out. And then there's this one. This is big. Larry has this. It's an inscribed. Um, um, it's got a couplet on the back um, here. You can see it. Um, a Kangxi period sort of a, a, a beaker, beaker form um, brush pot. Uh, this is a really nice uh, brush pot. Uh, it's, it's sort of a light blue, but it looks absolutely right. Um, here's the back of it. Um, you don't see these very often. This is an inscribed example. It's got uh, it's got a couple of days to go. It closes Sunday. It's up to thirteen hundred dollars. I expect this is this is going to spike at the end, up around probably three to five thousand. Uh, there's a picture of the bottom of it. That's a nice looking foot. Looks all right. These look the very you know sort of telling speckled black dots that you see often on the bottom of Kang Shi wears. Um, Here's a side view of the foot, a little bit of fritting in here. And there is a, a replaced, there was a small chip out of the top of it, as I recall, that they put back. Um, there it is. And that's a pretty, if you, if, you're, if you buy this and you want to get that fixed, a restorer can, can close up those, uh, those gaps from, from, the, from the piece that was stuck back in pretty easily. It's not a big repair to do. Um, and, but expect this to bring three to 5,000, I think, by the time it's done. All right, and then over to this. You remember a few weeks ago we saw a silver, silver and enamel um, Chinese fan that brought a lot of money, four or five thousand um, dollars. And here's another one. And this is by, coming from our friend Steve up in New Hampshire. Um, and this is uh, Coast to Coast Antiques. Um, uh, he's a, a very active picker up there. He works with his son. He's been in business for I don't know 30, 40 years. He's an old hand. He's been around forever. You run into Steve at auctions all the time. You used to see him all the time. He's very, he's a colorful character, as they say, but he's, he's earnest and I think honest and I think he's a good guy. So um, there you go. Uh, and this is, this is uh, nicely done, nicely worked. It's got a little tiny bit of damage here at the top, but the rest of it looks good. And the silver enamels, um, the silver and enamel filigree work looks very, very good on it. It ends in a couple of days. It's up to $810. Expect it to get up to probably uh, 1600 to 2000 at least before it finishes, but a good example. Also on the newsletter page this week, and then this this um, is uh, export ware for the Islamic market, the Middle Eastern market. Uh, this is a well-known type with the with the with the orange circles. You, we've all seen them if you've been collecting for any length of time at all. And uh, this is coming out of a seller here in Massachusetts, the Antique Co-op. Uh, got one of these, and uh, I don't know them, but they're they're in Southboro, right? Yeah, Southboro, Massachusetts. Um, nice looking plate. Um, it looks absolutely authentic, 18th to early 19th century. It's up to $232. It's probably going to jump another few hundred before it closes on uh, tomorrow. Uh, that'll be on the newsletter page. Now, this is a mystery to me. I don't know what where everybody is. This closes in 16 hours. It's a Kangxi period um, 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 uh, dish. Um, it, it, it's it's it's. I don't know what's it's got. I mean, it's got some rubbing to it and a little bit of fritting around the edges, um, but it's it, it looks fine. It's a, sell, a seller named uh, Beldelt. I don't know who that is. Um, he's over in London. It's this is up to just thirty-five dollars, and it closes in sixteen hours. 
um, and I have no idea where the bidders are on this. It should bring four to six hundred dollars, I would think. It'll be on the newsletter page. If you want to take a shot at it, go over and leave a bid for heaven's sakes. I think it would be a pretty good buy if you can get it. Um, there's the side of it. Look at this, the edge of it there. Um, you know, that's classic Kangxi fritting. Maybe people don't think it's Kangxi or maybe think it's a misfired. It's, 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 it's a serving dish that has an indent here for your hand and you, you, know, you put your thumb over it. Um, nice looking thing. So uh, go check that out. And then this, this is uh, something from Migalari of this very, a very elegant sort of classic um, 1770s, uh, uh, you know, uh, China trade export plate with the, these enormous flowers. They used to make them so big. Um, you know, you have these sort of small landscapes, and then they have these massive peonies, very out of scale to the background. Obviously, they're not this big, uh, because there's a fence. <laughs> it's probably a four-foot fence, so this would be, a, I guess, a seven-foot flower. But it's 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 a matter of perspective, and it's how they decorated them. And I love the uh, these uh, uh, border decorations. Very, very attractive. Very, very pretty. It's up to $64. Expected to jump probably double, go up one and a half times more where it is. But it closes Sunday. Nice porcelain. And I think he also has another listing with two of these in it. All right. And he also has this. If you're looking, if you want a punch bowl for your center of your dining table and you don't want a China a standard China trade one, look at this thing. It's a 40-inch bowl. So it's about 15 or 16 inches in diameter. It's a nice big stout piece of porcelain. Nice deep cobalt decoration. Uh, made during the second half of the 19th century. Uh, but rather nice. I, I, I like this. It's got some heft to it. It's got a chip out of the rim, I notice, up here. But it's not, it's not a disaster. You can always get that fixed or just ignore it. But this is a great bowl to put in the middle of a table. Um, I'm a strong believer in using porcelains that you buy. Have them out in your house. Put them places. If you have a, if it's a planter, put a plant. And if it's a vase, put, put, put flowers in it. If it's a bowl, put it in the middle of a table. Put some fruit in it. You know, keep it full for people that come by and want to grab an apple or something. This is a great piece of porcelain. Um, it shouldn't be displayed. You know, I, I don't believe in the, uh, nice utilitarian. If you, if you, it's okay to display them on bookshelves and whatnot for people to see. But if you have a dining table or, or, or a nice big, you know, sort of community table or a front hall table, you know, p uh, you, use things like this to decorate your house. Um, live with the stuff. Fill it with fruit. Put objects in it. You know, keep your car keys in it. Uh, but this is a nice bowl. It's up to two hundred and forty-six dollars. Should go up a good bit more. Should go up to six or eight hundred by the time it closes. But it's a nice piece of porcelain. And the shipping on it, I noticed, wasn't you know, it's it's a big piece of a big piece of ceramic. It's a hundred bucks or so to ship here um, from England, which is expected. Which is expected. All right, and then this, um, this is, uh, again, I, 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 this is from uh, Mr. Neal over in the UK. He sells, he's an interesting dealer. He's, he's, he's made a real study of these uh, uh, Mother of Pearl game pieces, um, and I think they're fabulous. They're, they're absolutely fabulous. Occasionally, when you get old China trade lacquer sets and things like that, you'll find some gaming pieces in it. Often they're undecorated or minimally decorated, but they did do some extraordinary pieces, often um, as custom orders for very wealthy British families, and they were incredibly expensive to have done uh, to have a set of these made because um, if you look at all the work the engraving on here it's like it's like a, it's like it's like engraving on a steel like on a steel uh, to produce currency beautifully done and uh, it's up to nine dollars um, if, you, if you're looking for an interesting area to collect uh, by all means um, collect uh, uh, unusual gaming pieces because I, I think they're just stupidly undervalued I think they're little gems I absolutely love them and, uh, and then um, also up will be this. I'm going to put this in the newsletter page this week. I, I, once in a while, I find uh, Buy It Now items that I think are very reasonable. This is a Buy It Now Plus to make an offer. It's only $200 for this very pretty uh, uh, Kutani vase. What I liked about it the most, it wasn't the primary decorate. I mean, the geishas on the front are attractive. They're sort of pretty um, uh, uh, picking flowers and whatnot. But on the sides, it is flower, uh, butterflies. Butterflies. Butterflies flying among vines. I think those are absolutely wonderful. I, I would love the whole vase done with these, actually. It would be rather very beautiful. Um, and this is a, a good size vase. It's uh, about 9 or 10 inches tall. And they're not asking a crazy price for it. It's marked on the base. There's the Kutani mark right there. If, you, if you're looking for some redware to add to your collection, there you have it. 
now over here to what's coming up now an auction turned up this week it's, it's already been added to the global pages there are a few more items from this sale i'm going to add to the the global member pages you know in the patreon global pages uh but but this is a sale that's coming up in um uh, plainville new hampshire and this is a, a, an auction house i'd been to before um uh, it's not far too far well it's two hours from here i guess it's William, um, uh, William Smith Auctions. He's been in business a very long time. This is this is if you if you've ever not if you've never been to the quintessential New England auction, the ones that we all think of when you think of old auctions in New England and the countryside with the tent and the whole thing. And he doesn't use it under a tent. He has a building nowadays, but he started out selling under tents years ago. Um, he he gets real estates from New Hampshire attorneys. Down from down in the Concord area and so forth, and this is a the classic, the quintessential New England estate auction. These are the kinds of sales that if you've been in the business, um, we we're in the business back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. These were the kinds of auctions that you went to, even if you were specializing in Chinese stuff or something else. Um, these were the kinds of sales you went to early in the morning. The dew was still on the ground, and you went, you know, under a tent often, and you'd walk through, and there'd be objects like these all over the place. There'd be a table with the jewelry in them. You could go examine the jewelry but all this wonderful stuff and there's some beautiful furniture in here i had mentioned in other videos about about buying antique furniture versus uh, modern furniture which to me is just rubbish crap garbage um i, I the only modern furniture i allow in my house is uh 20th century uh, modern design uh like Bauhaus furniture and, and that sort of thing um, the chair I'm sitting in is, is a Bauhaus design because they are actually comfortable. Antique furniture can, and sofas and so forth can be a little uncomfortable, uh, but they're good for hallways and occasional settees and things like that. But the case furniture um, you'll find in these sales are, are so wonderful and just a hundred times better than anything being produced in Indonesia for you know, or, or in these uh, you know, for IKEA and all these junk companies that sell rubbish. Uh, I'm sorry to say it like that. That's what they sell. They sell rubbish. And, you know, IKEA is going to be filling landfills all around the world for the next century. Um, shame on them because they're not producing anything that anyone is going to want to hand down to anybody. Um, when, when people buy IKEA, that's all going straight to the landfill. And uh, I think it's kind of, I think it's pretty horrific that uh, people furnish their houses uh, with that stuff because none of it is will be wanted by anybody um, once it's worn out because it's so poorly made, it's not worth saving. But here, you have some great opportunity to buy some great things. And if you look through here, you have this beautiful 18th century mahogany oxbow chair. I'm just going to touch on this for a minute. I'm not going to go on all day about it. But, I mean, you look at this. This is a wonderful piece of furniture. And, um, you know, to have this in your bedroom, um, to put your put your... You know, put your shirts in, your sweaters in, you can line it. It's a beautiful piece of furniture, all handmade, all hand dovetail, hand carved ball and cloth feet, made during probably about about 1750 to 60. Um, there you go. It's on its second set of brasses because you can see the old brass holes there. But, um, uh, you know, nicely done. There, there it is in proportion. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of furniture. Uh, starting bid is on its 1500. It's going to sell for three to five thousand worth every penny. It's a beautiful piece of furniture. And if it doesn't sell, you can always call them and try to get a hold of them and maybe get it. Um, and then the European stuff. These are a, a 18th and 19th century inlaid European. Here you have a continental inlaid commode. Um, a beautiful piece of furniture, all handmade. All this inlay, all this veneer is done by hand, all hand cut. And you'll notice when you buy European, if you ever do buy these pieces and you decide to dress your home up a bit, you'll find European veneers are very thick. Um, uh, somebody once said to me, they said, this can't be a veneer. It's a, almost, a, it's an eighth of an inch thick. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's, you know, they think of veneers, like they think of veneers in America as being a 16th of an inch thick, 32nd of an inch thick. No, English veneers and European veneers, French veneers, Italian veneers tend to be very thick because they didn't want them to come apart when the, when the, when the case shrank and so forth, they were easier to work with. But here you have this beautiful, beautiful piece of furniture, um, elegant top it's got a four panel inlaid top so you have the you get this crotch veneer effect to it and uh, what's the estimate on this five to eight hundred dollars the 250 dollars starting price and uh, if you had somebody make this for you today it would probably cost you five to seven thousand dollars to hire an ebeneast to really do it all by hand i'm not talking about 
the, the, the stuff that looks like this that's cranked out in factories in the Philippines. I'm talking about hiring an actual cabinet maker that knows how to inlay and knows how to veneer and knows, knows form proportions and how to do it all. It would four to six thousand, five to seven thousand dollars to have it made. And here you have it, and, and I'm I'm gonna bet you this goes for under seven hundred dollars. All right, absolutely wonderful. You know, if you want to get up there, go to the Smith's auction. Here's a Louis the Sixteenth marble top server. Um, you know that you can put um, um, in your dining room uh, with this beautiful marble top metal gallery around it, and then the uh, the these 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 vase form vase form feet with metal metal terminals on them. Um, Fifteen hundred dollar uh, high estimate, five hundred dollar opening bid. Dutch marquetry game table. I know, just pointing these out to try to broaden everybody's horizon, maybe a little bit. Um, this is a game table, and on it, what do you have? You have all the different things that you have with games, dominoes, decks of cards, and so forth. This was made in the 19th century, and somebody cut every one of these pieces all the way around. It's a handkerchief table, and um, um, put it out there, and then it opens up, obviously, into a games table itself. But let's uh, let's get into some of the Asian stuff before. Well, right before we do, this is, this is in this sale. And this is a, a Persian needlework, um, and from a distance, it looks a little bit funny. But when you pull it in, this is a wonderful textile, Khwajar period, uh, made in Iran or Persia. It was it was as as, as it was known in the day. Um, a beautifully done. It's got some poles to it and whatnot. But what a wonderful hanging, and it's big. It's like five feet long or something. Two to four hundred dollar estimate. You might want to check that out. Um, this is a little applewood stand that caught my eye. I just thought it was wonderful. These skinny legs. It looks like it's going to dance across the floor. Perfect, nice stand. Um, four to six hundred dollars. Again, a bargain. All right, now what's coming up uh, in the Asian world in this sale? There's quite a bit of stuff here. Um, one of them is this. It's, a, it's, a, it's two, two Hiroshi Yoshida woodblock prints. I don't know why they're selling them as, as one lot. Um, uh, this one is one of my, I'm familiar with this one. This is one of my favorites. The harbor scene because it looks like Gloucester. It looks like where I live, and it's it's very uh, 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 stylish. I, I I love I love this the way it looks, the feeling of it. It's very it's very sort of uh, 1920s uh, modern movement um, feeling to it. Uh, very very attractive. And there's a second one with it. I think the second one is 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 maybe worth a little more. But it's one of the it's one of the he did a series on the views of Mount Fuji, and uh, this is one with a, 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 a caravan of uh, Japanese uh, traders going up over a mountain. Uh, at any rate, um, four to six hundred dollar uh, estimate. It's got one bid already. I think it's going to do better than that. I think it's going to probably bring eight to fourteen hundred. But it's a nice lot. And then this. Um, and I posted some of these pieces. You'll, these will look familiar to those of you that use the Patreon page. I'd already posted some of these over here and some other things I haven't talked about um, that I think are pretty great that have turned up on the auction market. So if you're a subscriber on the Patreon side, hop over there and. and, and Take a look at the article we posted yesterday. Um, is this, this Chinese export boat, tea caddy and incense burner. Um, we see these once in a while. It was a form that they did. And you'll notice it's a side wheeler with a steam, a ste you know, with a steam uh, uh, chimney on it. And they started producing these as, as curiosities during the second half of the 19th century, around 18, the late 1860s or so. Uh, but very, very interesting. Um, um, there was a famous uh, British ship that went over there, Sidewheeler, and I think maybe a lot of them are sort of modeled after that. And then there were some other, it's, it turned up, and there's the top of it with the uh, different bins, and there's the other side of it. It looks complete. And there's the tea caddy. There's the caddy for it and so forth. And uh, this is the uh, lid. I guess the chimney acts as a vent for the, uh, for the uh, uh, incense burner if you want to burn incense in it pretty great thing it's got a very low estimate six to eight hundred dollars um it it's good size it is something like what is it uh, 20 inches long it's it's almost two feet long it'd be a great thing to put on a sideboard or a server if you have a, a dining room with a nice sideboard on it to lay this in there and you can store your tea in it it's actually use the thing all right and then this uh two reverse paintings on glass um, these are 19th century, second half of the 19th century, very nicely done. And the Chinese were, uh, did a lot of these reverse paintings on glass. There's a famous story of a, uh, uh, an American that went over there with a, with a Gilbert Stewart painting. <laughs> and he brought over a whole bunch of glass and he hired the Chinese artist, to, and you may have seen it, um, these portraits of George Washington on reverse paintings on glass. And they were all done, there were a hundred of them he had done in China. And he, he brought a, an actual painting by Gilbert Stewart of George Washington, which today, of course, is a multi-million dollar painting. And he had the Chinese artist copy it. 
And he brought the reverse paintings on glass back to America and was selling them. And uh, Gilbert Stewart sued him for copyright infringement. It was one of the earliest cases of, of artistic copyright infringement in the United States was bootlegging George Washington's image, uh, around, I think it was around 1800 to 1810. Sort of an interesting story. But at any rate, they continued painting glass right up to here. And uh, you have these, and they're in the, in the nice old original black lacquer frames with gilt trim on them. And um, I'm not sure if they're the original. They look like the original frames. Yeah, they're the original frames. That's what, this is what you see in old New England estates. That's how things look. Um, they have, this, this, this thing has not been out to a restorer. It hasn't been on loan to a museum where they cleaned up the back of it or did anything to it. This is, this is how it looks. And uh, these, these look nice. These look original. Um, and if you, if you want a reverse painting on glass, I think the estimate is ridiculously low. Four to $600 for the two of them. They are 13 by 19 inches, 18 by 24 inches overall, including, including the frames. They, sh they should, by all rights, bring eight to $1,200 a piece. Um, these are wonderful. Of course, shipping reverse paintings on glass is difficult, so I would, I would, uh, um, um, uh, you know, check with um, uh, Smith to see if they have somebody who is able to ship them, or try to find some way to ship them because they are prone to breakage. This, of course, is one of the big problems with the, with them and, and the vibrations and so forth. But they can be shipped. It's been done many times. We've shipped these um, all over the world for people when we've had them. We shipped actually a couple of them to Australia once. Um, and they got there just fine, but it, it takes a little effort. Anyway, these are going to these are on the um, uh, global pages, the Patreon pages already. And then this is also in the sale. This is a Chinese inlaid bronze, silver inlaid bronze incense burner. Um, the silver inlays here on the corners um, and so forth with relief work, silver inlay around here. And when you got the, if you buy one of these, you can go over it with a little bit lightly with silver foam and bring up all the silver, and the silver will really highlight itself. On the uh, on the bronze, you don't want to use a polish, just a light silver foam, just to clean away some of the oxidization. There's this wonderfully done um, food line on top um, with the ball, and there's this, and there's that. It's a, a, a daddy food line, and this is big. This thing is 17 inches tall. It's a very very large uh, incense burner. So um, if you if you're looking for a nice big uh, uh, mid mid 19th century incense burner that's inlaid with silver, highly desirable, uh, you may want to go after this. But don't be surprised if it brings a couple of thousand dollars. All right. And then this there's a very nice um, uh, Damascene a Japanese Damascene metal um, um, inro uh, ivory inro with lacquer on it. There's the Damascene box. I did not look up the mark on the box yet. Uh, but but uh, it looks like it's, I'm trying to think of the name. Some of you out there are saying it right now as I'm trying to remember it. It was a famous Damascene studio in Japan that made these things. And occasionally they did do work for inro makers and so forth and people ordering custom inros. And this was a nice one. It probably is ivory. I know they're not supposed to sell it online, but that's too bad. Um, they're selling it. All right. And then over to this, um, and, and the estimate is reasonable, four to six hundred, two hundred dollar opening bid with the Damascene box. The Damascene box is probably worth 300, 400. All right, and now over here to these Guan Yin um, um, figures. Uh, they are Blanc de Chine, they are 19th century, probably second half of the 19th century, uh, judging by the bottoms of them. They look nice, they're not a match pair, but boy, they're pretty close. They could certainly display as a pair. Um, the waves on the, on, the, on the bases are different. And uh, when you get around to looking up inside of them, there you are. This is the bottom of one of them, and that's the bottom of the other. And you'll notice there's some thickness differences. This one looks like to be the one of them looks to be a bit older than the other, uh, but not by much. But these are nice Blanc de Chine Quan Yins, and they're and they're good size. Um, what, what are they? Um, one of them has a, a, a there. Whoops. Go back to the ruler. Um, 17 inches in height, uh, roughly. So that, they're good size. These aren't little eight and nine inch ones. These are statue size. Um, the estimate is very low, three to five hundred dollars. Um, they should bring uh, this slot should bring a thousand to fifteen hundred, I would think, um, at least. And then there's also this. This is, these are very difficult to shoot. This is a, a, a they're calling it vintage Chinese carved rock Ruyi uh, crystal Ruyi head, plus likely late Qing. So they've got vintage and late Qing. Um, I think it's probably late Qing to Republic, but uh, it's a very nice uh, Ruyi head uh, carving scepter of, of, of uh, in rock crystal. This looks very nice. It looks like a very nice carving. And there's another shot of it. They're extremely difficult to get to capture on, on in a camera. But boy, this this looks like nice work. It's beautifully polished. Um, uh, the shape 
all of it looks looks it looks good to me. Um, so you might want to go after that. The estimate is nothing. Three to five hundred. Um, uh, expect this to bring eight to twelve hundred. And then over here to this, this is cool. Um, this is one of these. This is a nice nineteenth century, second half of the nineteenth century, reverse painting on glass with one of these wildly carved, um, um, uh, you know, sort of lattice um, and, and vine and bat work to relief worked. Um, uh, uh, carving wood carving all around it with a red with a, uh, gilded with a red lacquer background so it really stands out and they've got a picture of it with with an employee which i thought was genius of them to do there so you get a real sense of how it would uh, he, he seems to like it um um tattooing that's the name of this is that a tattooing it's a some sort of park anyway um this shows you how this looks in, in, in you know, in, in proportion to another person. This would be a great thing to have, a, a nice object to hang on a wall. Really, really nice. Very, very second half of the 19th century. Very cool. Um, three to five hundred dollar estimate. Again, I think I think their estimates are extremely reasonable. Um, and then this, this, this is this is a nice thing. This is a jade carved uh, a brush washer, or, or they're calling it a dish. It's a brush washer. It's big. It's eight and a quarter inches long. And I pulled this in. I really wanted to look at this because the color of the stone, this mutton fat jade, looked awfully good to me. And when I got in here and examined it with the insects carved onto the side of it, the way the handles are done, um, and up here, this this little this little leaf, the way it's curled underneath, this is beautiful carving. Um, and I do not believe this to be a 20th century carving. I think this is a 18th century probably um, jade um, if you have the chance there's another insect over here look at the details of that thing um, and so forth I would I would I would if you're a jade collector you want to give this some serious attention I think I think it looks awfully good the way it's polished there's that matte finish that you see on old mutton fat there's the bottom of it um, there's some sort of this is their inventory tag uh, this is look at this the shine on here the reflection Beautifully polished. That's the soft finish you want to see on these. The estimate is is, is very very low, eight to twelve hundred dollars. Um, it's got thirteen people watching it. it. Sales on March. The sales on March six, by the way. Um, that's a nice jade. I wouldn't be surprised if this brought five to seven thousand, maybe more. It's a nice piece of jade. And then this, the Meimoyama period inlaid lacquer Japanese casket or chest. This is a reasonable sized chest. It's not. This is not a giant trunk. Uh, but this is one of these rare, rare, rare um, uh, mother of pearl and uh, uh, gilt and lacquered um, chests, the dome top chests that they did um, in, the, in the 16th century, um, 15th and 16th century. Beautifully done. Often they often you often see these in conjunction with when they talk about the Nambam um, period. Uh, this is very nice and, and rather unusual. And I don't think we've talked about one on on the on our on the channel here, uh, turning up anywhere um, in the last five years. I can't remember the last one that turned up. Well, this is the kind of thing that turns up in old New England estates. Uh, and it looks awfully nice and it looks like it's in very good shape for one of these. Usually these things are a mess by now. The lacquer's falling off. They're missing all their mother of pearl pieces. Lots of mother of pearl pieces missing. It's got a couple of losses down here in the corner, but nothing significant. The starting price is $1,500 and that's more than reasonable. Um, it should bring the, it should easily bring the estimate these do not turn up often. It's a pretty rare bird. And also they have a nice Chinese rug. If you're looking for a good Chinese rug, this is one. It's got a lot of color in it. It's made during probably during the 1920s or 30s or something. Uh, but beautiful, beautiful cobalt. And notice there's two shades of cobalt, a lighter shade for the water and a darker shade for the sky. And some of the leaves are a little darker. And you have flying birds and blossoming of flowers and spotted two spotted deer in the foreground and whatnot and it's a good size rug it's five by seven five five feet by seven feet eight inches the estimates very modest four to six hundred dollars two hundred dollar bid to get it started you want to check into that and this is one of my favorite things in the sale for obvious reasons is this beautifully carved um uh, uh 1820s to 1830s or 1810 to 1820s um a carved ivory table box this is a wonderful box, and um, uh, it is ivory, 
So depending on what country you're in, you want to be a little careful. Um, but look at the carving on the end here. This is all spectacular work. And it had some uh, in, uh, gilt bronze, probably mounts. It looks like gilt bronze added to it sometime when it was here in America. Um, you know, Yamanaka Company or somebody may have done it. And it's got a beautiful gray velvet liner on the interior that's been added. Uh, so the, whoever used, whoever owned this used it. And it has its original key, which is almost a miracle. Uh, so there you have it. Um, and these scrolled feet. I love this thing. This is great. The estimate is free. Four to six hundred dollars. It's got two bids already. It's uh, ten inches long, four inches wide, four inches deep. It should easily, easily get up uh, into the a thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range. And um, uh, it's a great box. If you've been looking for a great ivory box, um, uh, you know, everybody knows how much I like carvings. This is a great box. And uh, again, estate stuff is the best. Estate stuff is so much fun. And then there's also this, another, this is my second favorite thing in the sale, actually. Well, I like the jade a lot, but I love this little bronze uh, recumbent elephant. It's a Japanese bronze recumbent uh, elephant um, incense burner. He's awful cute. There you go. Simple. There's the top of it. Looks like it's got wear. Meiji period. Um, how big is this? Eight by five inches by five inches. Absolutely charming. Six to $900, $300 opening bid. Um, again, a great thing, a fun thing, uh, something you could enjoy for a long time. If you like Japanese bronzes, look at this thing. Notice the patina on it; it's just wonderful, and the detail, the the the, the sleepy eyed, the sleepy eyed elephant that they, how they were always portrayed in, in in China and Japan. In this case, it's Japanese. The Chinese depict them the same way. I love that. Uh, and then over here to this China Trade miniature export point painting. They have not been able to identify the sitter. Um, a, a most likely a China trade merchant or a re relative of a China trade merchant because they would often go to China and bring portraits and engravings and images of family members and ask the port uh, artists in, in Canton, Guangzhou, to, uh, to, to do them on ivory for them. And um, I expect this to be on ivory, I fully suspect. Uh, it's got a, a $250 starting uh, bid, five to $800 estimate. It's a great thing. It's a very, very fine painting. And, it, and when, you, when you look at this, you have some idea just how skilled these Chinese port painters were. Just how superbly um, they could do miniatures. Just absolutely great. W based on a photograph or, or an engraving, rather. All right. And then this, just a reminder, this sale is coming up in a couple of days before we, uh, before we get another video on here. This is that lot of 10 export gouache paintings of the uh, tea production that's coming up at Material Culture. Um, down in Philadelphia. Uh, it has a, a one to $2,000 estimate. It's already got four bids. It's up to 1500 Expect them to bring uh, four to $6,000, I think would be a reasonable estimate. These are great pictures. I love them, and they're framed. All right, and also coming up uh, at Material Culture, I just, I just want to keep checking, make sure it's still them. They have a number of Japanese, uh, Chinese robes, rather. This is, this is a nice one, a summer robe. Uh, probably on, on a gauze ground. There's some silk robes as well. There's a whole bunch of Chinese silk in that sale at Material Culture. It's on the global pages, on the Patreon uh, global pages as well, of course. Um, but the, this is a nice looking robe, some legitimate wear. Often look, look at the collars because there's often sort of soil and sweat and things from people having worn the thing over the years. There's a bit of wear on this one. Um, looks perfectly legitimate. Four to six thousand dollar estimate. Should, it should bring three to four thousand. I don't know about six thousand for a non-silk robe, but it's it's a nice one nonetheless. And then this, I, I pointed this out to the uh, Patreon users the other day. Is this this very nice and interesting Japanese lacquered porcelain? It's an arita bowl that's been lacquered and gilded with the with the underglazed blue showing through um, here. With these with these, um, it's, it's a phoenix, I guess. Um, coming in and you have these long these long sort of stylized long um, uh, tails or a peacock tails peacock feathers coming off of it it's very cool and this is a big plate as I recall it was 18 inches in diameter it's got a repair to it it's not perfect it does have a repair but it wouldn't bother me at all um, the repair is over in here uh, you can see it from the back but this, these do not turn up very often. These are very, very unusual. And if you're a Japanese uh, uh, arena collector or a Japanese lacquer collector, or you collect both, you, you've got to have some of these. The Japanese lacquered porcelains do turn up here and there on the market, but they weren't produced, widely produced. A lot of them were sort of produced, more of them were produced sort of the middle end of the Meiji period, but some were produced well before that. 
And uh, this is very striking. I think it's I think it's graphically very very successful. Uh, the estimate is 100 to 1,000 dollars. I don't know where they came up with that. This is the Aqaba Gallery, um, and they 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 I don't think they do their own shipping. So you want to get a shipping rate, and it should bring five to seven hundred. It's a nice looking dish. Um, and then this, this is just a quick reminder that um, Top Wells has a sale coming up. Be careful at Top Wells because they do sell some copies and so forth, but they also sell some nice things like this, a very nice rose water bottle in a very soft, light, almost yellow, um, uh, cafe au lait uh, ground uh, with a sort of double, double gourd uh, uh, or triple gourd uh, body on it and, and underglaze blue. And it looks like it's in good shape because these often when you get these, you'll see, notice that they get damaged at the top. Because, because they get used when people shake them out. They bang something with them. This one never happened to it. Uh, four to $600 estimate. I think that's that's probably on the on the low side. But it may go for that. But the $200 opening bid is a no-brainer. When you have things like $200 opening bids, hit them with a bid. Just hit them with a bid. Um, say, I say the same about eBay. I say the same on any auction. Put bids on things. You never know what's going to happen. And um, over time, as your auction approaches, if you get outbid, it gives you time to go back and contemplate it and think about do you really want it or not um, in, uh, at a higher price. And often you'll find you do because your gut told you to bid on it in the first place. All right. And then over to this. This is this is coming up. Uh, this is I put this on the I have to fix this tomorrow on the global member pages, because when I look down here, I saw Bonham's London. This is very confusing. It's but it, and up here. You say ships from Marlborough, Mass, because it's being sold by Skinner's and they it, Bonham's has to straighten this out uh, because it's confusing to people. Um, um, because they're going to see these ads on live auctioneers and say, oh, it's in England. I'm not buying a rug in England and shipping it to America. And they don't bother to look up here um, and read the fine print under ships from. Um, and if, if you're going to lose a lot of people that way. I think it's a bad way to, um, to, to promote their sales. Um, but they have this. It's very nice Baudu uh, carpet. This is a good size one. I think it's five by seven feet. It looks to be in excellent condition, uh, probably from made between 1900 and 1930 from what I'm seeing. But I love the colors. I love the shading. Um, very, very pretty. They only have one picture of it. They don't have a picture of the back of it. Um, that's another thing. they have. Oh, they're dating at 1920. That's about, yeah, that could be, sure. Um, five foot three by seven foot eight. Nice looking rug. And then they have another Chinese rug in here. But if you go to the, look at the rugs in their sale, be careful when you look at them because the, 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 the photography that they use, I don't know what they were using for cameras, but the rugs are all washed, sort of washed out looking. They're overexposed like this. They, 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 didn't do the rug, they didn't do the rugs any favors. I don't know who's doing the photography, but they need to get somebody who's a little bit better. Because if you, if you come in here on this detail shot, you'll see the colors are much, much, much richer than they were in the primary shot there. Here they look washed out. Here the colors look pretty good. So you, it's, 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 they, they got, they got to find some better way to do the photography, I think. Um, but at any rate, this is a, a very nice Iranian Hariz, six, nine by 12 feet, um, with a thousand to fifteen hundred dollar estimate. I love Harizas. Um, I've owned a few of them here in the house and some a big Farhan Saruks too, like carpets. Um, anyway, this was, this was a nice one, but the Chinese rugs look good. Uh, this is a five by nine, um, with a, with a, with a rondelle in the center. Um, um, nicely done. Looks to be in good condition. Chinese rugs are fairly prone to wear, so don't put them in high traffic areas. They're good, nice in dining rooms, um, um, and maybe in a den you use occasionally or a library or something. Uh, but they they do tend to wear down. Absolutely, put a pad under them because that reduces wear on the rug uh, from people walking on it because it's got some softness behind it. But uh, I like the rug, but I like this one the best. I think that is um, just elegant as all get out has a very low estimate, and I think it's, it's something worth looking into. All righty, and then um, this, uh, just a reminder, um, Vieling Wies de Jaeger is coming up um, in uh, a few days uh, in this wonderful Kangxi bowl that's in it. Uh, it's a very large bowl. What is it? Uh, uh, 34 centimeters, 14 inches in diameter. And uh, what is the last thing? Oh, this. Um, I saved. This is JG Auctions London. Um, just quick, quick, quick. Everybody come back before you go. <laughs> Um, it, this is a really unusual Arita teapot. They don't turn up very often. You've seen this style, this sort of idea um, on Yongchen and Chinese teapots with these applied flowers and appliques all over it and so forth. The Japanese took the, took, did these on occasion with Arita wares during the 18th century. And here's, a, here's one of them. Now, some of the flowers will probably be missing, I'm sure. But this is a really unusual teapot. This is very, very, these are fairly, these are quite rare. 
Um, you see them often in institutional collections, but you don't see them very often on the market. And I don't think I don't think we've talked about one of these in in um, either uh, again in, in like the last five years. Rather unusual. Uh, so if you if you collect a reader wear and you want something very unusual, you might want to look at this teapot. It's got a big estimate on it, fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred pounds. Um, it's coming out of um, a JG Auctions in London. But if you're an Arita buyer, this is a rare bird. And uh, they're calling it early 18th century. Uh, to me, it looks middle 18th, but that's splitting hairs. Who cares? Um, it's a nice thing. It's a rare thing. And th remember, this was very, uh, 18, early 18th century was very early in Japan's um, uh, 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 production of porcelain. Uh, the Chinese, of course, by this time had been making it for 900 years. The Japanese had only been making porcelain really they uh, for about 50 years at this point in any sort of earnest way they had learned to make it earlier but not not in any not with any sort of serious production serious production of porcelain in japan didn't really begin until the 1670s they they beefed it up a little around 1650 1670s onward they they produced a lot of it but a lot more of it but not not anywhere close to the volumes that were going to be coming out of china but they were they were sort of getting into it to compete with the chinese so anyway, it's a nice pot. That's my point. That's a nice teapot. So that's about it for the week. All right. Um, uh, thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. I didn't mean to go on. This is a long video today. It's almost an hour long. My apologies. But um, I had a lot to, to get into. And I had that other video I did earlier today just to get everybody sort of keep it all up to date. And uh, we're going to have some interesting videos coming up next week that I'll be, I'll be, I think I'll be in shape to, to, to work on. Um, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit better for those of you that have been wondering. Um, and so forth. Uh, thank God uh, for medication. And um, here we are. All right. So see you all soon. Have a great weekend. Subscribe. Check out the newsletter page. If you haven't subscribed yet over there, um, subscribe to it. It's free. And if you want to join the uh, Patreon or um, global member pages to get the access to all the stuff on Live Auctioneers and Valuable, um, go ahead and do it. It's, it's very, very inexpensive. Five bucks a month. Um, and we, we think it's a relative bargain these days. And uh, have a good weekend. See you all soon. All right. Bye-bye.